I've always wondered, why is fried food the most addictive food in the whole world? No matter what you do, you just can't stop eating it. One more crispy wing, one more crunchy french fry, one more salty potato chip. And it's about one thing and one thing only, crunch. But can anyone just toss something in some hot fat and it magically becomes delicious? Is it really that easy? Honestly, yeah, well, sometimes. So why does nobody do it? Maybe because it can be a little messy or it could burn your whole house down. That's a good reason. But today we're gonna change that. I'm gonna make you a frying expert by teaching you the rules to frying anything and everything. I'm gonna walk you through all the proper steps of every method and technique using the world's most popular fried food recipes. And we're gonna rate them on our brand new crunch factor scale. Following what we teach you here can lead you to thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of different recipes. These are the techniques that I spent years learning in restaurants and also personally, but they're also secrets that chefs have been keeping that I'm giving away to you because I love you. So that being said, let's make this, shall we? When I say everything, I mean everything, including my new cookbook. It's out now and you can get it. The link's in the description. Please go buy it. It's a New York Times bestseller. Thank you to you. It's been given the title of one of the best books of 2023. And it's a perfect gift for the holidays that are coming right around the corner. So go to the link in the description, get yourself a copy. I hope you love it. Okay, to do this correctly, we have to understand the following. One, what the hell is frying? If you've ever seared something in a pan, you've come this close, that's the size of an ant in terms of distance, to essentially frying something. And ironically, borderline, you've made the same amount of mess. Frying is defined as the cooking of food in another fat, typically a high volume of that fat at a high temperature. It's the rapid expulsion of moisture and rapid drying of the exterior to create crunch. Pause. Sautéing. I'm gonna be honest, my opinion, not really the same thing. Although some may believe it to be, I'm gonna say that's wrong. You have two ways you can fry something, either deep frying, where you fully submerge it in a fat, or shallow frying, where it's something more like a pan fry. The fat doesn't go past about halfway up the item that you're frying, all right? It's shallow. You ever go in a pool, it doesn't go all the way up to your neck? We're just going up to the waist. The point is to properly fry, you need the right depth of fat. We're gonna show you all techniques that best fit every way to fry something. Look, any amount of hot fat in front of you can be daunting. But as long as you follow the three rules of frying, you can wield the power of deep frying with no fear. Rule number one, maintain oil temperature. If your oil gets too hot, no, I have all this oil, wah, wah, wah. It's fine, okay? Very simple. Pour some room temperature oil in, and that will instantly cool down the temperature of the oil. Just keep doing that until it reaches the temperature you need it at. Now, sometimes you get a little bit of overfilling when that happens, which brings me to rule number two. Never fill a pot more than 60 to 65% of the way up. Obviously, it depends on what you're frying, but as you add items, remember, the hot oil oil rises and sometimes even foams up. You risk it filling over, and by the way, oil is flammable, so not great if it spills over. If you do overfill it and it's hot, use a long metal ladle to carefully scoop out and remove oil until it reaches the level it needs to be at. Rule number three, keep water and other external liquids away from hot oil. Hot oil and liquid don't mix. And in this instance, it's a great way to start a massive and highly difficult to extinguish house fire. So just drink your water elsewhere. Okay, so it's game time. You're ready to fry. You're not scared anymore, okay? Papa's here to hold your hand all the way through. Don't you worry. Now, the majority of things in this video, we're gonna be using high heat canola oil. You can also use avocado oil if you're rich, because, well, avocado oil is ridiculously expensive. You can also use any animal fat or oil that can withstand up to 375 degrees Fahrenheit. Ideally, you want something neutral unless the goal is to flavor the food with the fat. Here's a list of them, but if you wanna know more, just click the link at the bottom of the description. In this video, we fry everything at 300 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 176 degrees Celsius. Frankly, if you don't know what to fry something at, chances are it gets fried at this temperature. But not always. Always double check. Moving on to our very first method, number one, frying something straight up. The simplest, most foolproof method that can literally be applied to anything. Meat, veggies, chips. This means no flour, no dredge, no breadcrumbs, nothing. And I got a few examples for you. Starting off with, well, just some skewered lamb. This is also called chislic. Skewered lamb, salt, pepper on both sides, and deep fried at 350 Fahrenheit or 176 Celsius. With nothing added to this, we have the most beautiful Maillard I have seen in a while. Here's a classic one, wings. Do they even need to be sauced if they're fried perfectly? with no flour, no nothing. So you season your wings, salt and pepper, deep fry in hot oil, being sure not to overcrowd the pot, move the wings around a little bit, and fry for about six to eight minutes. Or until GBD, golden brown delicious. Using a spider, remove, transfer to a mixing bowl, and season with salt and pepper. We're going plain Jane. I just want to see if the frying alone is the key. Brussels sprouts. Just about everybody would love Brussels sprouts if they were fried. So again, no batter, no nothing, just raw cut in half Brussels sprouts, slowly lowered into 350 Fahrenheit oil. They do pop a lot, so if you do this, just don't be alarmed. Let that fry till it gets a nice GBD, which is like four to five minutes. Remove. Now at this point, you can put them in a bowl, toss them with salt and pepper. Normally fried Brussels sprouts are sauced with something salty, sweet, tangy, maybe even a little spicy. Yes, this is how the restaurants do it. They're deep frying that shit. 
And finally, the most classic straight up fried item is a potato chip. I have thinly sliced potatoes that have been lightly brined and I just dry them, toss them in hot oil in batches, fry for three to four minutes while constantly moving till a very light golden color, remove with the spider, transfer to a mixing bowl and season to taste with salt. And by the way, if you want the full recipes, they'll be in the link in the description on our website. Now let's taste and see where these land. Starting with the chislick, which is just fried meat. Oh yeah, tastes incredible. The Myrad's wonderful, it creates a nice little crust. It's not like the crunchiest thing in the world though. Crunch is maybe like a one and a half. Flavor is amazing. That said, you could probably get the same thing with the sear. Moving on to the wing. Damn, that is good though. I do love wings. The skin helps a lot. You get a lot more crunch. Granted, there's no breading. So it's like a two and a half. Brussels sprouts. Okay. First off, there is no better way to prepare a Brussels sprout, period. Roasting will never compare to this. Stop saying, oh, well, we could roast. No, you have to fry it. The flavor, 10X by frying it. With crunchy leaves, I'd give it like a 3.2, roughly. And finally, potato chips. Bonjour. Full stop. Quite possibly one of the most addictive foods on planet Earth. My mouth is like moist right now. Compared to all these, this is an eight on the crunch scale. Way more crunchy than the rest. And all you need is the potatoes, oil, and salt. Of all of these, easily the humble sliced potato benefits the most from frying straight up. Now, moving on. Method two, dust it. So this is quite literally a starch that a raw ingredient has been tossed in with the excess shaken off, AKA a light dusting. Creates a crust, it helps add viscosity to sauces that are made, and the interchangeable element is the starch. Could be all-purpose flour, could be potato starch, corn starch, so on and so forth. The best example here is chicken piccata. So you got butterfly chicken breast seasoned lightly with salt, dredged in flour with the excess shaken off, add a quarter inch of oil into a hot pan. Once the oil's hot, leave the chicken in the pan Shallow fry for two to three minutes, flip and cook for another two to three minutes. Once it's golden brown on both sides and cooked through, well, it's pretty much done. At this point, you can use the pan to make a sauce, such as a piccata sauce, or really anything that needs to be a little bit thickened, because you got those stuck bits of flour that will help thicken it. I'm a little nervous here. I'm not sure that that's gonna be enough for the crunch factor. Let's find out. Okay, dusted shallow fried chicken. Perfect example of a chicken piccata. I'll tell you right now, it does not feel that crunchy. Look, tastes amazing. The real reason that you dust something is to leave some residual flour in the pan so when you make a sauce, it's a little thickened and you get a thin crispness on the outside, but that's about it. It's tasty, but it's not the ideal method. We have way better ones coming. Method number three, the wet marinade. I know that sounds a little weird. What do you want me to call it? The moist marinade? So typically you take ingredients out of a marinade and then bread them. This one, you quite literally just throw everything in a bowl of your marinated meat, for example, which creates a batter-like consistency and then you fry it straight up. I have a couple fun recipes. So we have Yan Suji, which is from our Every Way Fried Chicken video. So we have our marinated chicken. We quite literally just toss in one cup of sweet potato flour, toss everything together. Once it's got a paste, we gently lay and fry into hot oil for four to six minutes, pull it out, season it with a little bit of seasoning mix, and it's done. I mean, look at the crust on this. There's something here with this technique. Next up, hot yai. Yeah, exact same concept, but this time we're using rice flour instead of sweet potato flour into our marinated chicken. Toss, add the wings to hot oil, deep fry for four to six minutes, and transfer to a wire rack line baking sheet. This one just gets garnished with a shitload of fried shallots. Both of these look incredible. Now let's find out if maybe we should rethink whether or not we throw away our marinade. You could do this with regular flour, but sweet potato flour is what is traditionally used in this chicken recipe. That's not the point of this though. The point of it is marinated chicken with flour added straight up and you eat it like that. It's a single tier. Could it be just as good? It's really good. It's a different kind of crunch. Crunchy and airy at the same time. I'm gonna give it a solid seven on the crunch factor scale. It's a chewier crunch. It's not as explosively crunchy, but I like it. It's enjoyable. And now for hot yai. Oh, ours just tastes like a Krispy Kreme donut. You just get a certain special kind of crunch from this, but this one's even more glass-like in a good way. So I'll give this a solid crunch factor of 7.4. Now method number four, the two-tier fry. Look, the best way I can describe this is one of the most iconic fried chickens in the world. Southern buttermilk fried chicken is what essentially represents this method. The first tier is the wet dip or slash marinade. The second tier is a starch, usually a spiced up starch, AKA flour and spices. And the interchangeable element is quite literally both the starch that you use and the liquid that you marinate in. Those are your elements. You wanna use rice flour instead of all purpose flour? Give it a shot. You wanna use different liquids, broths, jams, sauces in your dip slash marinade? That's fine. So we have our separate bowl, buttermilk, salt, MSG. Onion powder, white pepper, garlic powder, paprika, whisk, toss in some chicken thighs, and of course you can marinate or you can honestly immediately bread after these are tossed together. Then for the second tier, which is our dry dredge, you got all-purpose flour, salt, garlic powder, black pepper, paprika, MSG. Whisk. Now, obviously the marinated chicken goes into the flour, you coat it, you fry it. Now, I do have a fun technique here though. Before I bread my chicken, I always dip my hand in the marinade and flick in tons of little tiny dots of my marinade. I whisk that together and that creates little balls that when pressed onto your chicken when dredging will turn into nice little flakes. 
Okay. See, balls are great. Now you dredge your chicken in your flour while aggressively pressing the flour into the chicken so it adheres. Shake off the excess. There should be no bald spots. None. Now lower that into our hot oil to deep fry for five to eight minutes or until GBD. This looks beautiful. I mean, come on. There's something special about the look of a southern buttermilk fried chicken. You see it across the room and you're like, I think I'm in love. And I definitely am right now. Could this be the greatest way to fry something? Let's find out. All right. Buttermilk fried chicken. I love it. I don't even need to bite this. Listen. Oh, mommy. Oh! I've said it before, this is a perfect bite. It's amazing because it combines so many different textures in one. Texture over taste, by the way, available now. Links in the description. The outside is so perfectly crunchy, just like the potato chip. What I love about it is all the little craggles create little waves of crunch. You see all these little flakes in here, though? Every little layer, as your tooth bites through, it's like brrrr, all the way down. So it creates a diverse crunch experience. It's not like a potato chip. I'm gonna give this a crunch factor of 8.3. And the beauty of it is, on top of the crunch, you get a little bit of chewy from the meat. It's juicy, it's fat. I mean, God damn. Leaps and bounds from being dusted. Essentially the same ingredients, but all we did was add a liquid component. The liquid binds to the flour, and instead of having a dust, you create a crust. Moving on, method number five, three-tier fry. This is probably one of the world's most beloved methods of frying today. It's very basic, a three-step coating process. You have one dredge that's just plain flour, another that's just plain eggs whisked together, maybe a little splash of water. And then finally, the interchangeable element in this is what we'll call the breading. This can be breadcrumbs, cornflakes, really anything dry and crumbly. This is how you make katsu, this is how you make schnitzel. You can literally fry anything with this method because it will form a breading that actually sticks after frying. You probably even fry an iPhone. Now let's use our example of katsu. We have our three-tier setup. The breadcrumbs are obviously panko. That is the key indicator of a katsu. And really, you just use a thinly pounded butterfly pork chop, go into the flour, coat all sides, into the egg wash, and finally, in the panko, make sure you coat every little crevice. No bald spots. Every tier here must coat every single crevice, crack, hole, I don't care. Now, obviously, this gets deep fried beautifully for anywhere between three to four minutes or until GBD and cooked through. We use a spider to transfer to a wire rack season lightly with salt. I mean, look at this thing. It like glistens. Now, our other example would be schnitzel, which is very similar, but instead we were swapping the panko with just plain fine breadcrumbs. You can also season your eggs, the flour, the breadcrumbs with a little bit of salt, maybe some spices, thinly pounded pork cutlet into the flour, the egg wash, and finally, the breadcrumbs. Now, the main differentiator here is this one actually gets shallow fried in hot clarified butter. It's authentic, but it's not my favorite fat to fry in because as you can see, it does have a limit on how hot it can get. So you're gonna fry that beautifully, constantly moving and shaking the pan to ensure an even cook. Cook, flip another two minutes, and transfer to a wire rack, season with salt. I'm not gonna lie, there's a nice like a schnitzel right there. This is also the ideal dredge for things that get liquidy, like mozzarella sticks, something viscous like ice cream. And what is the key? You have to deep freeze that liquid before you fry it. Now we have our katsu and our schnitzel. Let's see how deep fry stacks up against shallow fry. So, love schnitzel. Shallow fry doesn't need to be deep fried. I believe traditionally shallow fried, actually. Look, it's delicious. A beloved classic for a reason. Crunch factor, I'd give it a solid six. It's not that explosive of a crunch. It's a very light sort of brittle melt in your mouth crunch, but not crazy. It's meaty, it's unctuous, it's rich. Classic for a reason. This could very well be the crunchiest thing today. I mean, look at this. Just barely holding on to it makes noise. My God, that is so perfect. It's just like so viscerally crispy, crunchy. It's got the same layers, beautiful pops of crunch all over the entire thing. But the best thing about it is it does not get soggy. It adheres to the meat. And the flavor, of course, is ridiculous. I think I'm gonna have to give this a solid 8.8. .8. Borderline a nine. It's so perfectly crunchy on the outside, but you get that softness on the inside. It's not a one-dimensional crunch. It's a multi-dimensional crunch. Moving on. Method six and seven are two versions of thin batter deep frying. The first, tempura, which uses carbonated water in the batter for lightness, and then second, beer batter, like fried cod for fish and chips. So for method six, we'll start with a classic shrimp tempura. You quite literally just mix cake flour with a little bit of all-purpose flour, maybe a little touch of salt, and also sometimes people will add baking soda. You add some carbonated water, an egg, and whisk gently so you don't overfroth the batter. You could switch carbonated water with beer, or maybe just split it with a little bit of a lime soda if you want that kind of a flavor and a little sweetness, but be careful on sugar content in carbonated beverages. Now lightly dish your shrimp in all purpose flour, dunk the shrimp into your batter, and immediately add to your hot oil. Obviously, you deep fry till GBD, but if you want to step this up to a more traditional tempura, then you do what's called painting. You dunk your hand in the batter and gently drizzle over the cooking shrimp while turning the shrimp, and you get these little flakes. 
we're giving this a little bit of a leg up on the crunch scale by doing that. So once it's GBD, pull it out. Now for the beer battered cod. In a large mixing bowl, add flour, salt, cayenne, garlic powder, white pepper, and whisk, and pour in your beer. Obviously, this is where you could use a different carbonated beverage if you wanted to. An egg, whisk gently so you don't froth up that batter. Now dredge your cod in the flour, making sure it's fully coated, and gently drop into your hot oil. Fry until a beautiful GBD, and you know, it's not bubbling like crazy anymore, which depending on the size of your pieces could be anywhere between four to eight minutes. Transfer to a wire rack, lined baking tray using a spider and allow that to drain its excess oil. Now let's see how these two dishes compare. Thin batter, AKA essentially tempura, right? You got a classic tempura and you have a beer batter, which is very similar to tempura. Cheers. Listen, you ever had tempura, you should know what this is like. It's thin, wispy, melt in your mouth. Not an explosive crunch, a wispy crunch. Now for the fish, a bonjourno. Same exact context as this. A little bit more flavor though, which I do like, but it's different. It's a deeper crunch, a little extra pow. Crunch factor wise compared to everything else, it's like a 6.8. Now let's see what happens when we thicken that batter up. Method eight, a thick batter. You gotta think thick pancake batter. That's the texture you want. So let's use corn dogs as an example. You got a mixing bowl, you add all purpose flour, cornmeal, sugar, baking powder, and salt whisk together. Then add buttermilk and an egg. Just keep whisking until it reaches a thick pancake batter texture. If you need to add a little bit of buttermilk, you certainly can. At this point, all you need to do for any food item you fry in this is dredge it in all-purpose flour, fully submerge it in your batter, and immediately drop it into hot oil. Do that with a corn dog, you can do it with bacon, you can do it with broccoli, you can do it with anything. Cook for four to six minutes or until GBD, transfer to a wire rack, and now let's taste. Cheers. <laughs> So look, it's good, tastes great. You, we all know what a corn dog's like. There is a little crunch, but let's be honest. That type of a batter leads to a fluffy, almost pancake-like interior, more like a donut in a way. So crunch scale, to be nice, I'll give it a one. Method number nine, wok fry. This is the Swiss army knife for frying. It has an interchangeable oil depth. You could shallow fry, although it's ideal for deep frying. The perfect example is Chongqing chicken, but obviously you can fry anything in here. So we dredge our marinated chicken, toss in cornstarch, we're gonna deep fry it, tell GBD, remove it. Then we're gonna drain the majority of that oil. Then we're gonna add something called kaiziyu, which is a key oil to Chinese wok frying. Now we're switching over to a shallow fry. So first we toast our Szechuan peppercorns until fragrant, add chili flakes, shallow fry when tossing often, then add green onion, garlic, jalapeno, cook till softened. Finally, add your chili pods, toss, add your fried chicken back to that, then season with sugar, salt, and MSG. At this point, it is now a stir fry. Transfer to a bowl, and now you can see that this was essentially three different kinds of frying in one vessel. That's the beauty of wok frying. But where does it land on the crunch test? Okay, multi-purpose, come through, please. I'm gonna be honest, out of all the things we ate, this is by far the best tasting thing. Something about the taste of this is just remarkably good. It's like umami to the face, salty, fragrant, aromatic. I can barely talk, I'm juicing up in here. All right, we're here to talk about texture. This has just enough crunch to bring it to the promised land. I kind of wish it had more crunch, but traditionally it's not usually super crunchy. It's like a light crunch and mostly chew. I'm gonna give this a crunch factor of maybe 6.8. Not bad, but not remarkable. But the flavor is <laughs> flavor special. Now moving on. We saved the very best for last. Method number 10, the most famous fried food in the world, French fries. Which funny enough, falls into what we're calling the par-cook method. Now the interchangeable element is the method of par-cooking you choose before frying the food. Fries usually get parboiled and par-fried before they're fried a third time. But you could bake, roast, boil, par-fry, grill. It's a special technique that chefs use to make the most deliciously crunchy fried items in the world. So for fries, very simple. Potatoes cut into small batons, well, fry shape. And that goes into boiling water with a touch of baking soda, salt, vinegar, parboil them, pull them out, immediately cool, dry. Then we're going to give them a light deep fry, okay? This isn't super hot oil. That's the secret. Pull them out, drain them. Then you're gonna freeze them solid. Once they're frozen, they're gonna go in for a deep fry for a second time until the crispiest, most beautifully crunchy French fries rise out of the oil. Tears streaming down your face. Did I really just make this? Yes, you did. You deserve a kiss for it. French fry! <laughs> I love French fry. Whenever I eat French fries, I like to grab like three of them at a time. That's kind of the beauty of a french fry. Oh, listen, before I rate this, I wanna clarify something. A french fry has something special about it. It's not just the crunch of a french fry that makes it great. It's the crisp crunch on the outside and the fluff on the inside. That's what makes a great french fry. Typically, a french fry doesn't have a crazy crunch level, but these, on the other hand, this recipe, which, by the way, is in my new cookbook, Texture Over Taste, I know. Shameless plug, but if you haven't gotten it, be sure to get a copy. The link's in the description. And if you do have a copy, thank you so much. Don't forget to review it on Amazon. I love you.
Now, this I would rate on the crunch scale a solid seven because it is so beautifully crisp and crunchy on the outside. So perfect. If it were crunchier, closer to like a potato chip, I might give it an eight, eight and a half, or even a nine. But it's not really supposed to be. It's a perfect fry. And a perfect fry should be right there on the crunch. But wait, 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 wait. I'm left with all this oil. What am I supposed to do? Ah, the age old question that everybody asks me six billion times a day that I keep answering and I plan to give my final answer here. Please, if your oil didn't get burnt, you can let it cool, strain it, leave it in your fridge in an airtight container and use it one to two more times before you need to toss it. Some people might argue three to four times. That's disgusting and honestly, probably unsafe to consume. So please stop. Now, when it comes time to dispose of the oil, you can either cool it completely, pour it back into the bottle you got it out of, and then close the cap on that bottle and throw away. Or you can use an oil coagulant, like fry away. We use this stuff all the time. This is not an ad, but we genuinely love it. You sprinkle this stuff in there, follow the package directions, heat it up, let it cool, and it quite literally becomes a solid mass that's very easy and safe to throw away. Here's the moral of the story. Obviously, there are a million ways you can do this, but using any combination of these techniques, ingredients, liquids you use, etc., you could lead yourself down a road of any fried food you could ever imagine using the tools we have given you today. So use this power wisely. Love you.